do 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 All right, good morning. Uh, today's presentation is IOM 310303BB, Inorganic Compounds Part B. So carrying off where we uh, left off with Part A, moving into uh, ionic bonding uh, and how we form inorganic compounds. So we'll carry on with that a little bit, get, get a little bit more familiar with uh, combining those cations and anions together and making uh, some compounds and then we'll learn uh, a little bit of, about some characteristics of some common uh, inorganic compounds. So again, uh, good uh, fundamental chemistry knowledge here. Okay, this module teaches you how to name compounds, how to read and write their chemical formulas, the purpose being to help you avoid costly and dangerous mistakes, such as using the wrong compounds and solutions to calibrate liquid analyzers. Of course, assuming that we're still in the day and age where we're uh, mixing our own solutions, uh, it does still happen, um, not super often, but uh, the market is such now where you can buy a calibration solution in basically any concentration that you want. Um, however, it is uh, handy to have one standard solution that you can uh, dilute as required. And we'll talk about that in a, in a different module. Uh, but again, this gives you a uh, kind of basic background in chemistry. So you have a general idea of uh, what is what and what not to do with certain uh, chemicals. Okay, quick review from last ILM here. Uh, cations are positive, anions are negative. Together they make ionic bonds. Ionic bonds happen between a metal and a non-metal uh, and they share their uh, electrons in some kind of a ratio. And depending on the number of elements in the formula, it could be binary, meaning it has two elements, or ternary, which is three elements. And there's probably more, but lucky for us, we don't have to worry about that. So here's a, bion, a binary ionic compound, and you can see it's made of magnesium and two atoms of chlorine and some kind of a ratio. Uh, and looking at the subscripts here, we can see that it's one magnesium and two chlorines. Uh, magnesium being the cation, again, the positive ion, and the chlorine being the negative ion. So when we write it, it's always cation first, followed by the anion, and then we do the crisscross applesauce, as I like to call it, um, but we'll be very familiar with that by the time we're done. Next step of uh, naming would be a, a ternary, a basic ternary, and you can see magnesium, sulfur, and oxygen, so three elements uh, in this particular type of ratio. Uh, what changes here and is what is typical uh, for our studies anyway is when we get ternary ionic compounds, uh, Two of them are generally combined into what we call a polyatomic ion. And these polyatomic ions are uh, really a generic kind of collection. And if you printed off the periodic table of ions that I provided for you, uh, you will see uh, in the top that there is a table of polyatomic ions. And that's where you'll find most of the ones that we deal with and the charges that are related to them. So if we looked at this example of magnesium, uh, with sulfur and oxygen. The sulfur and oxygen combination is called sulfate. And if you looked on that table, on the periodic table of ions on the right-hand column, about halfway down, you'd see sulfate uh, listed as SO4 with a two negative charge, just as we see here in the diagram. Uh, magnesium also has a, a two charge, a positive two charge. So when we do the crisscrossy applesauce, uh, the twos disappear because we uh, bring it down to the lowest common denominator and we end up with this formula of MgSO4. Third and final step in the most complicated version of a ternary ionic compound that we're going to do um, involves again taking uh, one of these polyatomic um, one of these polyatomic ions and putting it together with a other element 
In this case, we're using ammonium, which is one of the very few uh, positive uh, polyatomic ions. And we're going to combine it with sulfur. So if we looked at the periodic table of ions, again, you'd see that ammonium uh, NH4 with a one positive charge. Uh, sulfur on the periodic table is a two negative charge. Uh, so when we do the crisscross applesauce over there, the one from the NH4 will come over here by the S. The two uh, from the S will come over here on the outside of the brackets of NH4. Uh, and that's how that crisscrossy uh, applesaucey things kind of work uh, as we move forward. And it doesn't really get any more difficult uh, than that. But again, what this is telling us is the, the ratio, right? This is like if you were baking, and I always use baking as an example, uh, you generally take your wet ingredients, uh, put them in a bowl, and then you take your dry ingredients and you put them in a bowl, and then you mix uh, those two bowls together to make your cookies or whatever the heck it is that you're making. But essentially what you're getting here is uh, one bowl that contains the, the sulfur, and then you have another bowl that has uh, two parts of a combination of, let's say, salt uh, and flour or sugar and flour. And that ratio between sugar and flour is one to four. So you'll have, uh, let's say, a cup of sugar and four cups of flour, but you're going to have that twice. So that is as confusing as it probably uh, is as it gets in the ILM here. So hopefully uh, that won't cause too much problem for anybody. Uh, and I wasn't showing my arrows again because I was on the wrong screen. Okay, uh, other ionic compounds. So this works generally for most of the stuff that we deal with. Uh, there are other ionic compounds in, in addition to binary and ternary. Uh, we're gonna look at three other types identified in this module. Uh, those are ones that involve transmission, uh, transitional metal compounds. Again, that section in the center of the periodic table. Uh, some other variable oxidation number metal compounds that are kind of specific and uh, unique and kind of have their own rules. And then uh, the, the third one and the last one, which is most important to us in third year because we uh, do a lot of water analysis uh, and acids and pH uh, come into play uh, very heavily in our course outline. So acids is the third type of ionic compound that we're going to look at. Okay, just for review again here, this is a the periodic table of ions that I've provided for you. Up at the top here is that smaller table of polyatomic ions here. And you'll see you'll find uh, all the ones that we deal with in this course up here. Uh, sulfate, for example, was a previous example. Uh, ammonium was a previous example. Uh, and then, of course, everything in this wonderful red square here. Uh, these are what we call the transition uh, metals here. And you can see lots of stuff going on in this little section here. Um, whereas all of these elements have a charge on them, uh, lots of these elements, as we see here, have an option of a couple of different charges. So we're about to delve into how we how we deal with uh, determining which of these particular ions it is that we're dealing with when we're naming and making formulas. Okay, so the thing you need to remember about the transition metals is that they, of course, have more than one oxidation number that we saw on the previous screen. Uh, zinc and silver are the only ones that uh, that don't, that we worry about anyway, or that are mentioned in the ILM, and um, that's just a fact. And the way we different, differentiate between uh, the different uh, charges that we see in the transition metals is by giving them Roman numerals, uh, and they tell us which oxidation number to use. So if it's the, uh, if it has a choice of uh, a positive one or a positive two ion, the one would be written with a Roman numeral one, the two would be written with a normal uh, numeral two. Uh, two uh, however, it would happen to apply. <clears throat> okay, so to write the formulas using these variable oxidation numbers, it's uh, not extremely complicated. We'll walk you through the steps here. Um, and the exercise in the ILM says, let's jo join a chloride ion that has a negative one charge uh, with the following. Uh, cations that we see over here. So we have iron with a two and iron with a three, platinum with a two and a four, uh, and mercury here with a one and a two. So again, there's some basic rules. Uh, it's always cation first, and then it's crisscross applesauce. So I'm only doing the, the first one here. Um, 
Iron has a positive two charge, chlorine has a negative one charge. We crisscross those charges and move them down uh, into the subscripts. And the one disappears because we, we just don't have to write the one and the two goes over here and the formula becomes FeCl2. Because this iron here has a plus two charge, we know that it's iron two chloride. So the name here uh, takes iron and the chlorine atom uh, combines them together. And when we do that, the INE portion of the chlorine disappears and we replace it with an IDE suffix and it becomes iron two chloride. Uh, when we combine it with this one, it would be iron three chloride. This one would be platinum two chloride. This would be platinum four chloride. This would be mercury one fluoride, uh, chlorine, chloride. Uh, this would be mercury two chloride. So uh, a few practice runs through this uh, and you should have her all under control, I hope. Okay, so getting the name from the formula. Uh, again, I just basically described this process. Determine the oxidation number for each um, element or portion of the formula and then make a zero balance equation. And this is a little bit more confusing than the way I just explained it. Remembering that we, we know one of them uh, already, typically, uh, given the formula, we, we have uh, one with a fixed oxidation number, and then usually the other one is the variable oxidation number, and that's what we're trying to determine. So we figure out which one uh, it happens to be. We write their symbol and their oxidation number, so Fe2 plus or Cl minus, whatever it happens to be. And then we'll name the compound with the cation first again, its oxidation symbol and subscript, followed by the anion and its subscript uh, and uh, identifier in that order. So an uh, example here would be uh, copper 2 bromide, which would be C-U-E-R-2. And that tells us that we have copper 2 bromide. So. Uh, the explanation of doing it this way is more difficult than the way I probably described it on the previous slide, but let's do one for exercise sake here. Uh, here we have a compound called mercury uh, and nitrate, so nitrate polyatomic ion, mercury the individual ion. We have a two over here. Uh, which one of these is a transitional metal? Well, we know that this is a polyatomic ion from the table. So thereby, this one is the transitional metal. And you can verify that by looking at the periodic table and finding mercury and determining if it's one of these uh, elements that has the two oxidation numbers. And if we look for it, uh, there it is, uh, element number 80. And it has a choice of, well, that's a unique one, 2 plus or 2 plus. I, I haven't really noticed that before. Um, so this is kind of a no-brainer. We don't know which one it is. We know that nitrate from the polyatomic ion chart has a charge of minus one, and together they have to total up to zero. So again, this subscript tells us we have two of these. That's why we're multiplying by two. So its contribution is minus two. So along with minus two, something has to equal zero. That, of course, would have to be plus two. So plus two plus a negative two is zero, so thereby we're using mercury that has the positive two charge. In this case, we call it mercury two nitrate. Uh, don't ask me what the situation is regarding the other mercury here. Um, you won't see that in a, any other example. So we've covered it one way or the other. Okay, and working backwards now, getting the formula from the name. Uh, in this case, we have platinum four oxide. So this is pretty straightforward. Uh, if it says platinum four, that's automatically telling us we're using the one that has the charge with the number four. In this case, platinum being a cation uh, has a positive four charge. Oxide is uh, one of our um, basic ions. Uh, we, we use this quite a bit. We should know almost by heart by now that it carries a negative two a negative two charge. So if we were to write this out, we would take the platinum uh, and the oxide, we do our crisscross, the applesauce here, the four from the platinum comes down over to the oxygen and the two from the oxygen 
comes over here to the platinum and we write it PT204, but remembering the rule, uh, re reduce to the lowest common denominator, um, divide by two will get us PT02 as a final formula for that name, platinum four oxide. <clears throat> Other variable oxidation number uh, compounds, again, this is um, just a fact worth mentioning here. Tin and lead uh, in group 4A have variable oxidation numbers and we can look uh, group 4A, which is the uh, fifth group over from the right-hand side down at the bottom there, you'll see they have variable oxidation numbers, uh, but technically we don't count them as transition metals. Uh, that's a Cliff Clavin trivial pursuit type question. Right there. Okay, so that kind of gets us through the general idea of uh, naming particularly ionic compounds. Um, and the reason that we spent most of our time uh, detailing ionic compounds uh, is because that is what most of our course content revolves around. We didn't really delve too much into too many uh, covalent compounds, uh, if you uh, didn't pick up on that. Um, but we will um, hit on a couple of them very, very briefly. But again, the focus is mostly on ionic uh, compounds because they are related to the water science uh, and the analyzers that we, we cover mostly in third year um, material. So now we're taking a, a big step forward here and we're going to learn about uh, some general compound classifications. Uh, inorganic chemistry deals with the elements of compounds that are, are not carbon-based. We learned earlier that the difference between uh, inorganic and organic chemistry is the fact that inorganic deals with uh, those element uh, compounds that aren't carbon-based, and organic chemistry deals with uh, compounds that are largely based on carbon and hydrogen bonding, uh, because, of course, almost all, all organic material is made out of carbon in one way, shape, or form. So ionic compounds, uh, again, are a combination of a metal uh, cation and a non-metal anion usually, but we can classify them now and we're going to classify them now into four uh, specific families or types uh, which have similar characteristics uh, in terms of uh, the compounds. So what we're going to be looking at here is uh, what is an acid, what is a base, what is an oxide, what is a salt, uh, how do you make them, how do you name them, uh, and how can you differentiate one from the other by looking at the chemical formula? Okay, so looking at a hierarchy here, uh, org chart, ionic compounds are breaking down now for us into acids, bases, oxides, and salts. And we're going to learn a little bit about something uh, about each of these uh, different families. And it's a lot, uh, a lot easier than the read. Uh, the PowerPoint will bring this uh, to light here for you um, really well. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. Okay, so we're going to start out here with acids uh, on page 13. Acids are a water solution, right? All acids are uh, typically liquids, and there's uh, some kind of an ion dissolved in a water solution that contains hydrogen cations. This is the big rule. Acids are a water solution that contain hydrogen cations. So whatever it is combined with, it must have hydrogen cations. So that's hydrogen with the plus one charge. The name of the acid is derived from the type of the anion that is in the aqueous solution or the water solution that it's made with. You must always put the subscript AQ, which stands for aqueous, which is a fancy chemistry word uh, that means dissolved in water uh, when we write an acids formula. So the general formula for acids based on all these words here is hydrogen cation combined with some kind of an anion with the subscript AQ written after it. And we'll look at a couple of examples here. For example, if I take the cation, uh, cation bromine right here, uh, which has a negative one charge, and I combine it with the hydrogen, which has the plus one charge. I do my crisscrossy applesaucy thing here, and I end up with HBr. And this is, uh, and then we put the aqueous here, and this tells us that this is uh, some type of an acid with bromine, just like this one over here, which takes uh, fluorine 
and combines it with hydrogen, fluorine. Uh, looking at the formula here, I can tell because there's no subscripts. Uh, it has the same charge as hydrogen, which in this case is a plus one. Crisscross applesauce, they disappear, and I end up with this HF and aqueous. So I know that this is some type of an acid uh, based on fluorine. Uh, how do I how do I name them? There's a couple of rules that we got to get out of the way here. So the first uh, thing we have to do um, is determine if the anion contains oxygen. So if I look at this, my anion is bromine here. There's obviously no oxygen. Uh, this one over here, my anion is fluorine, and obviously no uh, no oxygen. So if it does not have oxygen, the way we name it is we put the prefix hydro. And then we take the short name of the anion, add IC to it, and then acid. So this would be hydrobromic acid, and this would be hydrofluoric acid. If it does have oxygen, and we'll look at a couple of examples of that later, uh, we don't deal about the hydro anymore. We just have the anion name with the IC and the acid, uh, such as, uh, Sulfuric acid, for example, is a good example. So sulfuric acid um, does not have uh, does have oxygen in it because it's made with uh, hydrogen and sulfate. So we don't use the hydro prefix. So that's the only two rules that we really have to worry about in terms of name uh, naming. There is another one that you'll see uh, here on this slide, but we don't do it in this course, so don't worry about it anymore. Uh, so here's here's uh, the diagram. So does it contain oxygen? No as we saw in the previous example. So hydrofluoric acid, hydrobromic acid, fantastic. Does it? Yes. And that's where this rule kind of ends for us, but we'll go through it here just so you know. Check the ending at the end of the anion. Okay, so some of the anions can be ite and some of them can be eight. Um, all the ones that we deal with are going to be eights. So this is the only part you have to worry about. So if it ends in eight, such as sulfate or phosphate or chlorate, we add the suffix IC on it. So it would be chloric, fluoric, uh, sulfuric, whatever it happens to be if it ends in eight. Uh, if it ended in eight, but we're not going to have any, um, it becomes an us ending. Like uh, I can't even think of a good example of uh, so let me just see if I can pull one out here. Um, don't know. Don't know what we don't do it, so it doesn't matter. So basically, that's all you have to worry about. Does it have oxygen or does it not, not have oxygen? In which case, it either is a hydro or it is not a hydro. Okay, so again, here's that uh, hydronium iron or the hydrogen ion with the plus charge. Uh, you are going to be seeing this a lot this year. Okay, uh, the most important thing to remember when trying to name some acids, acids must have a hydrogen cation, which we call a hydronium ion, and you'll hear that uh, a couple thousand times moving forward, uh, because it is very uh, relevant to water analysis and analyzers. Okay, so let's, let's look. We're identifying acids because acids must have this cation in the formula. So let's look. NH4I aqueous, is this an acid? It's a combination of NH4 with a plus one charge and an ion to iodine with a negative one charge. Does it have a positive hydronium ion as its cation? This is the cation and it's not H plus one. So no, it's, it's not an acid because it doesn't have the cation, it's a non-acid. It's something dissolved in water but it's not an acid. Okay, next one, potassium uh, hydroxide is the name of this solution. Aqueous is a kind of just water solution. Doesn't necessarily mean it's an acid, but it does mean it's a water solution. Uh, potassium hydroxide. So what do I have here for cation? My cation is potassium with a plus one charge. My anion is a hydroxide with a negative one charge. Do I have a hydronium ion in here? do not have a hydronium ion. So no hydronium, not an acid. Next example, uh, HBr. I'm not going to give you the name here because it's a giveaway, but what's it made out of here? The cation always first, H plus. 
Wow, look at that. Anion Br negative. So yeah, it's got the H1 cation, therefore it is an acid. Does it have oxygen? No, it does not. Therefore, it is hydrobromic acid. Example number four, H3PO4. This is a polyatomic ion called phosphate. This is three hydroniums. What do we have here? We have hydroniums, absolutely. And we have phosphate. So yeah, we have a hydronium cation, so it is definitely an acid. Uh, does it have oxygen in it? Sure it does. So this is phosphoric acid, phosphoric acid. Hopefully, um, that's pretty easy to wrap your brain around. So that's acids. Key point, hydronium ion. Moving on now to bases, uh, which are essentially the opposites of acid. In order to be a base, the compound must have what's called a hydroxide ion. Hydroxide ion is represented by OH negative 1. And an important little thing to recognize here, uh, adding acid to water increases the hydronium cations, adding hydroxide anions reduces them. And this is how we use chemistry to modify the pH for our water and other fluids. And if we reflect back on this a little bit, if I took a H plus and put it right here and I did crisscross applesauce, what would I be left with? I would be left with HOH. And if I wrote it differently, I could write it as H2O, which happens to be water. Uh, and if I combine them in equal amounts, one of these with one hydrogen, they cancel out uh, and they equalize each other. And that's why I get water with the pH of seven, because it's an equal combination of an acid and a base. So that is a premise of water chemistry and analyzers, which will carry on into future lectures. Okay, so hydroxide ions combine with hydrogen ions to form water. We, we've seen this, and that's what I just described to you. Uh, bases use the same uh, naming convention uh, we saw in acids with the cation going first. Uh, and in this case, we add hydroxide uh, of the anion uh, second. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples here. Here we have KOH, which is potassium cation. By, uh, combining with the hydroxide anion, and the name is potassium hydroxide. Here we have calcium, which has a plus two charge, combining with hydroxide, which has a minus one charge. Crisscross applesauce gives us this formula, and the name is going to be calcium hydroxide, and so on and so forth. We'll go to the last one here, because this is a variable oxidation number one, uh, and a good example for testing here, this is Fe. OH3, right off the bat, I know because if I crisscrossed uh, to get this formula, I took the OH negative and put it over here. And I took whatever number was up here and I moved it down here. So I know that this is iron three hydroxide. And as we write it here with Roman numerals, iron three hydroxide. So uh, pretty standard convention, just a few rules. Uh, all you need to do is you know, a little bit of practice. Okay, going from names to formulas. Uh, again, here it's a matter of uh, going from the name to the ion. Uh, in this case, we have the lithium cation, the hydroxide anion. Uh, we write them, we do our crisscross applesauce, reduce to lowest common denominator, and that gives us LiOH, which is lithium hydroxide. Aluminum hydroxide. Uh, three positive cation, one negative anion, crisscross applesauce. Uh, remember to put your parentheses around here because this is a polyatomic ion and it requires parentheses to indicate that. And we get uh, Al3OH or aluminum hydroxide. Uh, last but not least here, copper two hydroxide. This copper two tells us that we're using the copper with the two charge. So Cu2 positive and the hydroxide with the one negative, crisscross applesauce again, the one comes over here, the two comes over here, parentheses for the polyatomic, and we get copper two hydroxide. Next family or category uh, is oxides. So again, uh, one simple qualifier here is that oxides 
com contain an oxide ion, so O negative two. They are common in reactions involving metals. Uh, most common to us is rusting, uh, which is represented as iron oxide. Oxides have the iron shown above, not other combinations. So it has to have this one specific ion, not in combination with something else. Okay, naming convention, just like other ones, cation first, and in this case, oxide at the end. So here's, a, here's an example, FeO, which is iron oxide. If I was to question you, because this iron is a transitional metal and has two oxidation numbers, uh, it has a plus three or a plus two, what would be the proper name for this? I took the three, if it was an iron three and I did my crisscross, I'd end up with an Fe2O3, which would be iron three oxide. Uh, because I don't see any numbers down here, I just can safely say that the two from here and the two from here crisscrossed, and this is iron two oxide. Okay, this one over here, tin. Uh, another variable oxidation number uh, metal with our oxide. Uh, again, how do I know which, which one it is? Well, I know that this is a two uh, for sure because that's qualifier. And I do my crisscross over here and I get two. Uh, and if I use the two options of tin, one of them is two and one of them is four. If I use the, the tin two version, they would cancel out and I would see no numbers here. If I use the four version, I would get uh, SN2O4, and then I'd minimize that by dividing by two, and I'd end up with this. So I know that this is tin four oxide. Tin four, good buddy. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> sorry about that. And again, same idea with the aluminum oxide. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that one because it is uh, hopefully not a polyatomic. It isn't. Okay, perfect. So that's oxides. So let's have a look here. What's our cation? Magnesium, uh, Mg2+, plus. our oxide or our O here is no two negative, crisscross, twos disappear. So magnesium oxide sure is. Here's another one, Ca with OH2. Cation is calcium, anion is hydroxide. Well, that's not an oxide. Okay, here's calcium. Uh, cation, oxide, anion, well, there you go, it is, there it is, so it's an oxide. Uh, toughest example here, not really tough anyway, but NiSO4, um, all you need to know, and this is why it's important to become familiar with that polyatomic ion table, is that generally, if you have a ternary, two of them are going to form into a polyatomic, and in this case, this is the sulfate polyatomic ion, uh, and it's also a cation, so thereby it is not an oxide. And this applies to that rule that the oxygen has to be uh, by itself. Okay, so that's oxides. Leaves us with one left. Uh, this is salt. So we've talked about acids, which have the hydronium ion. We've talked about bases, which have the hydroxide ion. And we've talked about oxides, which have the oxygen ion. If it is not one of the above, it's a salt. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If it doesn't have this, doesn't have this, or doesn't have this, it's a salt. Okay. Characteristics of salts, of course, they dissolve in water to form ions, and salt solutions conduct electricity. Um, this is the basis of conductivity analyzers, which, of course, is a subject that we'll study uh, in liquid analyzers. Okay, let's look at an example here. Barium chloride, uh, aluminum sulfate, iron oxide, calcium hydroxide, uh, silver oxide, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, ammonium hydroxide, uh, potassium nitrate. Uh, oops, back up one here. Okay, what do we have here? Let's practice naming these here. We have barium chloride, so BA, BA with the two plus, CO with the negative, one, which would be BACL2. Is it an acid? No, 
No, it's not an acid, no hydronium. Is it a hydroxide? No, because it has no hydroxide ion. Uh, acid, bases, oxide. Is it an oxide? No, because there's no oxygen ion here. Well, if it's not an acid, a base, or an oxide, it therefore must be a salt. Okay, here's another one, aluminum sulfate, and, and you can, uh, you know, you can run this through in, in your head like I am, or you can write down the ions uh, to verify it. But again, let's look. Does it have a hydronium as a cation? No, so it's not an acid. Does it have a hydroxide anion? No, so it's not a base. Does it have an oxide anion? No, so it's not an oxide. Therefore, it's a salt. Number three, iron cation. Is it an acid? No. Is it a hydroxide? No. Um, is it an oxide? Uh, yeah, it is. It's an oxide. Uh, and this one here would be iron two oxide because this two would come over here. This two would come over here. They'd cancel out. Iron two oxide. So it's an oxide. What's this one looking at it? Cation is not hydrogen, so it's not an acid. Anion is hydroxide. So there we go. We know hydroxide tells us it's a base. What the heck is H stand for? No idea, but that's a base. Okay, next one. Uh, silver with this oxygen over here. Is it by itself? It sure is. So this is an oxide. So this is uh, silver oxide. This one over here, cation is hydronium first one we've seen so this tells us that it is an acid and specifically this is uh, a sulfate does it have oxygen sure it does so this is going to be sulfuric acid last one uh, ammonium which is a polyatomic uh, cation one of the two that we look at so it's not an acid uh, second one is hydroxide, so OH, that tells us that it is, in fact, a base. I don't know why I'm using H instead of B for base, but I am. And last but not least, potassium, which is not hydrogen, so it's not an acid. Uh, nitrate, which is not oxide or hydroxide, so it's not a base or an oxide. Thereby, it leaves us to be a salt. So hopefully uh, that didn't overwhelm you. Uh, again, do the exercises in the ILM. If you have any questions, reach out to me on email and I'll be glad to help you with any questions. That is the end of Inorganic Part B.